Is everybody locked up? Uh -oh. All right, so we're we are um, on live stream now. It's happening. And um, I'm gonna switch. I'm gonna hand it off to Cindy, and um, I'll let people in as everybody they come into the. Locked up. Uh -oh. Hold All on. Right, so Hold on, just a are, minute. Um, on live stream. Just now. a minute. Oh, it's echoing from your. I'm gonna hand it off. That Me happens too. every time because it <laughs> kicks it on. It does it on my computer instead of somewhere else. All right. So, so Cindy, I'm going to hand it off to you. If you'll go ahead and get started, then I'll drive. Great. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone, to the League of Women Voters of Alabama Earth Day celebration. I'm really excited to be getting to continue the celebration of Earth Day. Um, I have my second vaccine on Earth Day, so we been really good to celebrate this year. <laughs> so I'm glad to be here with you all. Um, I'll ask that you keep yourself on mute um, while the speakers are speaking. That just helps keep the background noise down. And if you have questions at any time throughout, just um, post those in the chat if you're familiar with that feature. It's um, a little box at the bottom of your Zoom screen that says chat. And you can double click on it. It pulls up, a, a for me, a white box on the side that I can type in. And then you just hit enter on your keyboard and that message will come across. And it will monitor those questions and, and um, probably hold most of them until the end. But we, and if we have time and, and um, we don't have too many folks, we'll, if you're not on um, the chat, we'll let you, we'll try to let some folks come off Zoom near the end and, and have some questions as well. So we have an exciting program today. The League of Women Voters um, is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government works to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influences public policy through education and advocacy. And that mission applies to all our levels of organizations. So we have national and state level and local chapters of League of Women Voters. And so that mission applies to all of us. And I wanted to emphasize um, three words in that mission today, um, nonpartisan, education and advocacy. Um, the League has its roots in the fight for the women's right to vote. Um, so we, you know, we, we try not to, we don't focus on um, partisan politics as much. We really want everyone to have the right to vote and we want everyone to know and to, to be registered to vote and everyone to know what their candidates stand for on all sides of the, on both sides of the aisle. So most people know us for that voter education and registration. But the league also works in partnership around the state on many issues that impact Alabamians, including protecting the environment for all. So we have an amazing panel of powerful women today who work at the intersection of education and advocacy in this state and um, who are gonna talk to us with a focus on the environment for this 51st um, annual Earth Day celebration with the League of Women Voters. So we appreciate that. Um, so I'll quickly introduce myself so you know who's talking. Um, I'm going to be the moderator today. My name is Cindy Lowry. I'm the um, executive director of the Alabama Rivers Alliance in my day job. And we're a statewide nonprofit that works to advocate for clean water and protection of river ecosystems around the state. And we're an alliance of local um, community and water focused organizations as well. But I also will be wearing the, another hat today, which is I'm on the board of directors of the League of Women Voters of Greater Birmingham. And um, so that's I'll be speaking to you from both of those hats today, and I'm grateful um, to the League of Women Voters of Alabama to invite me to participate in this and to moderate. We have um, wonderful, powerful, amazing women who are going to share with you today, and so I'm going to quickly introduce them. I can't read their entire bios because they're so great, but I'm going to read a little highlight of them. Uh, we have Valerie Adams with us. Um, Valerie is from Wombly, South Dakota, I don't know if I said that right, located on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and home of the Oglala Lakota Sioux Nation, where Valerie is, enrolled, is an enrolled member. Valerie attended the University of South Dakota as a double major in criminal justice and sociology, and also attended Auburn University in Montgomery, majoring in elementary education and special education. Valerie has lived and worked over 20 years in Montgomery, Alabama, and Valerie co-founded and became the president of the Alabama Indigenous Coalition in July of 2020 as a native-led nonprofit organization to address the need in Alabama to advocate for indigenous education equity. And all of these um, great ladies are going to be able to share more about their organizations and themselves in a moment. I'm going to turn it over to them. 
So um, our next speaker is Casey Jones with experience in health and education and environment and conservation. Casey Jones serves as an advocate and supporter of quality of life in Alabama communities. Her background includes a BA in secondary education in biology and has uh, practiced as a high school science. She's practiced as a high school science teacher along with organizing STEAM and outdoor adventure programs for elementary age children. She currently serves as supervisor of youth programs at Tuscaloosa County Park and Recreation Authority. She will achieve her Master's of Public Health in May 2021. Awesome, go Casey. Um, in health education and promotion. And Casey has served on the Sierra Club Alabama Chapter Executive Committee for five years. And then we also have Maggie Johnston. And Maggie grew up in North Central Mississippi playing in the woods and streams. She attended the University of Southern Mississippi for her undergrad where she discovered paddling beautiful tranquil creeks such as Black Creek. She taught science at the Alabama School for the Deaf in Talladega, Alabama, where she lived on the banks of Talladega Creek in Waldo. Maggie retired from Alabama School of Deaf in 2004 to manage the educational program at Camp McDowell. She was director of McDowell Environmental Center. She helped start the McDowell Farm School and then started Alabama's first nature-based preschool, Magnolia Nature School at McDowell. Maggie is not very good at retiring, as you can see, so this year, <laughs> she um, unsuccessfully retired from Camp McDowell and has taken the position of Executive Director of Wild Alabama. Wild Alabama's mission is to inspire people to enjoy, value, and protect Alabama's wild places. So wow, what a great bunch of folks we have to talk to you today, women that we have to talk to you today. So I'm not going to do any more talking for now, and I'm going to let each one of them um, start off by sharing with us um, a little bit about themselves and their organizations and their mission, their goals, and some of the current issues that they want to lift up in the space today and share with you all. So we're going to start with Valerie. Valerie, I'll turn it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cindy, for that wonderful introduction. And also, thank you to the Alabama League of Women Voters for inviting me and Al as the Alabama Indigenous Coalition to be involved with your program. We're certainly excited to um, be involved in opportunities such as this um, being, well, we're, we're new, um, but certainly we do have a lot to offer other organizations. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So I want to begin first by introducing myself in my native language. Language, Hamidak Yapi Valerie Adams Emachiapi Sto, Wambli Hope South Dakota Imatahan, Na Lenal Montgomery Alabama El Watia, Ma Lakota Sto, Chante Washte Nape Chiuzapi Sto. Hello, my relatives. My name is Valerie Adams. I'm from Wombly, South Dakota, and currently living in Montgomery, Alabama. I am Lakota. I shake your hand with a good heart. Um, I'm the president and co-founder of the Alabama Indigenous Coalition, and very excited to be with you all for Earth Day 2021. Um, is what we call Grandmother Earth, is our, our subject. This is our home. And I think that it's important um, in our understanding as we go forward with these conversations that there is no plan B and we must honor her. I want to start today by doing the land acknowledgement. Alabama is the ancestral homeland of the Creek, Chickasaw, Cherokee and Choctaw who were removed from this land to Oklahoma along with 30 other tribal nations from across the United States. Currently, Alabama is home to one federally recognized tribe, Porch Creek Band of Indians, and nine, nine state recognized tribes. The origination doing land acknowledgement is to honor the traditional stewards of this land and their connection to this land. We must reconcile with this history so that we can move forward in understanding one another and follow through with action going forward. A little bit about the Alabama Indigenous Coalition. Um, again, I'm a co-founder with Tori Jackson Edwards, now Edwards. Uh, she's the Vice President of Program Advancement and the Senate of the Muscogee Nation. And I am president, obviously, an enrolled member of the Oglala Lakota 
Uh, we are native-led 50C3, working towards a future where all native people are visible and, and communities are respected and treated equally, both in Alabama and across the country. Some of the work that we've done so far is we've partnered with Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts um, in bringing relevant content to some of the activities they were doing and Tori uh, co-sponsored that and is doing other things with them. We were, we were uh, setting up different demonstrations. So we did an Indigenous Peoples Day demonstration in 2019. We did another Indigenous Peoples Day um, celebration in 2020. We've done virtual uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. We've sp spoken at uh, Stop Asian Hate. And we've also just been monumentally trying to bring voices back into Alabama that have not been here. We created partnerships with some of the area universities um, that have asked us to bring speakers regarding um, nature, um, regarding stewardship from the Muscogee Nation, um, also from Michigan. Um, and trying to bring the indigenous knowledge back into these into this area. So some of the goals that we have going forward, curriculum, training, partnerships, communication, culture, we feel as the Alabama Indigenous Coalition grows, we feel that there's a, there is a gap um, in the creation of the Alabama Indigenous Coalition. We understood that there were so many people here that were lost and needed to not only find each other, find their history, but also find their culture. And so we are trying to build a gap, build a bridge where we can share these inner knowledges with each other, as well as other people that are interested and increase the relevant information that we need um, locally and statewide. I want to show you something. Um, this is a map, it's from nativeland.ca, showcasing the 500, uh, showcasing the areas of all the locations of the different tribes pre-contact. Currently, there are 574 federally recognized tribes, but in total, there are over a thousand different tribes. And if you were to be in another place where you felt like you wanted to do your own land acknowledgement, you can use this as a resource um, in terms of finding out the people that once lived there and a little bit about their history and their culture. It's not comprehensive, but it's definitely a start. And this is usually where I like to start everybody in understanding that we're standing on stolen Indian land, Native American land. So Earth Day, um, I think that I'd like to start with a quote from my great grandfather. If this earth should ever be destroyed, it will be by the desire, by the lust of pleasure and self gratification, by the greed of the green frog skin, by people who are mindful of their own self, forgetting about the wants of others. He was a chief, he was a medicine man. Um, and I think for his age, he understood that what we were looking at as Indigenous people was marginalization, um, continually having our freedoms revoked, uh, continually being in a, po a process where things were happening to us that we could not control and policies made to make it so that we could not um, change them and we just had to adapt. And so one of the things that we need to understand about Earth Day is that we are the problem. Um, we have the capacity to understand that we can make movements to go forward and increase the knowledge of everybody else that, again, there is no plan B. Um, and understanding that earth, the earth, what has happened to us with, with colonization, with advancement, with has brought forth a severe slew of infrastructure problems that are affecting the earth. Um, when I look at this map and I compare it to the other map with all the indigenous nations, you can see definite places where brown, black, um, indigenous people are marginalized by the increase of infrastructure and the need for more money, the need for more energy, the need for 
um, more things that are very harmful to, to Mother Earth. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this in its entirety, but it's, it's, it's scary. Um, so I wanna to talk to you today about exploitation worldwide. When we talk about Mother Earth, we're talking about the land, the air, the water, and what we're doing to the earth is nothing less than criminal. Um, and it's really just for the, the sake of increasing our bottom dollar, increasing our increasing ways in which we are trying to survive. But yet, additionally, indigenous people are living within these areas and most of these things are done on indigenous land. We have the wastes from the sea of overfishing. We have the air pollution that, that continually um, is having to be checked and, and um, mining, which is going to the core of the earth, as well as the trees, which contribute so much to our, our oxygen. Um, I found this quote in the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit, and it was talking about how we as Native Americans revolve around our thoughts of, of Earth. And I felt like sharing this because I think that um, this is a, a very accurate assessment, how we feel and how that we are tied to the land. Um, Native cultures are directly tied to Native places and homelands reflecting the indigenous perspective that includes power of place. Many indigenous peoples regard the all people, plants and animals that share our world as relatives rather than resources. Language, ceremonies, cultures, practices and food sources evolved in concert with the inhabitants, human and non-human of specific homelands. The wisdom of native people includes songs, dances, art, language, science and music that reflect these places. By regarding all things as relatives, not resources, natural laws dictate that people care for their relatives in responsible ways. As climate change increasingly threatens tribal nations, cultural identities and practices, documenting the impacts of traditional lifestyles may strengthen adaptive strategies. So to me, what that means is that we must change our minds and how we view the earth. We must not continue this mode of continually stripping what Mother Earth is, ca is capable of. Mother Earth will go on without us. We cannot go on without her. And so with that, I understand that other people have come into, and I'll say Alabama specifically, Muscogee Creek Tribe does a lot of work with area people in terms of taking a look at what has happened here, species that are no longer here, plant life that is no longer here and trying to find ways to bring that back into our, our sphere in Alabama. I um, wanted to talk a little bit about the Dakota Access Pipeline and what that meant. We, in 2016, um, the theme water is life was prevalent. And I think that what got lost in translation was the fact that these, exploitations were happening everywhere. And so people came from all over the world to stand in solidarity because this is what we were looking at as a collective, as a collective of marginalized people. We were looking at our history in terms of the very top right picture that was exploiting Native Americans, specifically the Plains to control us on our own land by killing all of our food source. So what you see there are um, almost, uh, uh, those are all buffalo skulls. The ice shelves in Alaska are melting. There's drought in the Navajo Nation because of mining. Um, they're gonna be going into a generation where they don't even have, they've never even had running water fully as you and I know it. Um, the pipelines that continue to go underneath our ground um, in Bismarck itself, these are called flares, they're flaring, um, they're flaring ener uh, energy that's non-used into the air, into the atmosphere, closest to the reservations. 
And then you had the sturgeon because of the way that we try to control the water. They were going extinct in Wisconsin and that was actually part of their ceremonial process. And so with them going extinct, the tribes there, Menominee tribe, tried to revamp and come together as a collective to increase um, and rebuild what, what was done. So I think that continually as we stand and we try to understand why the indigenous people are so connected to the land, it's because we are a part of the land, the land is a part of us. Um, and everything that we do to the land, we do to ourselves. Um, I found this slide a while ago and I thought about what does it take to fully come to terms with how we perceive Earth Day. Earth Day is every day. We've got to change our thinking in terms of the way that we feel like we are on the top and everything else is below us and it's only a resource to be used to, to commodify. We are in partnership with everything that is in this earth, plant life, animal life, anything that happens is just a, is, is a sliding scale of things happening to other things. Um, when we start to lose our species, everything in this world has some has a purpose. And when we start losing that, we are endangering ourselves. Um, Chief Arbor Looking House, uh, Looking, Looking Horse is Lakota. He's the 19th keeper of the sacred white buffalo calf pipe bundle and bundle um, has said recently, on Earth Day, it is good to remember Unjipaka, Grandmother Earth is sick and it has a fever. In our cycle of life, it affects all life of spirit. The two leggeds have gone too far, breaking the wolpeg, the natural law. And I think that while I'm going to come off and share, I think that while we live this life and we proceed as if nothing matters, that we are causing severe detriment to ourselves and everybody else around us. And so, you know, happily, I will do Earth Day celebrations with everybody, but also um, it's a time for us to be serious about how we move forward. How do we make these changes? You know, if we base it based on our, if we look at our past, we can see that this is something that is compounding and it's gonna have to stop. And so that's basically all I have. <laughs> Thank you so much, Valerie. That was um, very powerful and, and very great way to open this, this hour and, and a half or so that we have just to really um, provide that big picture of what we're talking about and where we can and have to go as a movement. And um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Casey Jones now. And we do have um, some folks like Casey's group, like Sierra Club and, and Maggie's group working in Alabama to try to um, get get at some of these issues. And we're all in, obviously in partnership. And while some of us are just getting to know Valerie, we're so excited to be um, doing that and to have you um, join or to be in solidarity with you and help it really advise us in some of these, um, some of the work that we're already doing here. So Casey, I'll turn it over to you. It's hard to go after your presentation, Valerie. <laughs> and thank you so much for starting our conversation off that way because your words are beautiful, but they are critical. And that the action that we take really has to be, we have to see the connections and see our mistakes and then move forward. Um, and essentially, I think you were telling a story and I know that that is um, an indigenous, um, method to tell stories, but you know, all people tell stories. Even when we communicate, we're just telling a story. The story that was told to me was by my grandparents um, that I spent most of my time with as a child. And I can see that I'm probably the, one of the youngest on this call right now. And I am in, um, I'll be 31 next month, but it's been about 30 years of um, spending time in nature that has really just driven my life to everything that I do. Um, it was passed down, that love was passed down to me and concern was passed down to me by my grandparents. I started out um, kind of like 
watching birds off of the back porch and I was so good at it, the Audubon Society would show up and use me to collect data for their Christmas bird count. And then um, I was introduced to the Sierra Club through my grandparents once again, and they took me to the Sipsi Wilderness. We went, we went on a hike with the Sierra Club and I was probably about 11 years old at the time. And ever since then, that, 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 those values have been passed down to me. Um, so the, the values that Sierra Club in general, and you probably know we have a national organization, which is Sierra Club National. Um, it's, it's the oldest and, and largest um, grassroots environmental organization that has been very effective throughout history in making changes in environmental um, environmental action. And it was actually started in 1892, I believe. John Muir was the leader in that. Um, and we, we do have the, the values to uh, explore, protect, and enjoy the environment or enjoy the earth. But we do um, have, we have personalized it in the Alabama chapter. And I'm gonna share my screen here and show you some of the ways that we are working towards those goals in Alabama. Let me get this right, maybe here. Look okay? That's good. Okay. <laughs> Um, Sierra Club Alabama chapter, um, like Cindy said, I'm the vice chair. I serve with Joy Travis, who is chair. And um, some of the things that we work towards is education, advocacy, outings, and civic engagement. And all those things are based upon the national um, goal to enjoy, explore, and protect. Uh, we, we personally in Alabama want to protect our environment so that we continue, continue to and enjoy and explore it to the greatest extent for ourselves, for all people, and for future generations. And we are the Sierra Club Alabama chapter. I'll go back here. Um, we do have about 4,000 members across the state. Um, those, those groups of individuals, sometimes they operate as individuals in different places, but uh, most of our um, communication goes through our groups, which includes Coosa Valley, Cahaba, um, Montgomery, North Alabama, West Alabama, Mobile Bay, and we're also working on a Shoals group in the, um, in the Shoals area. Our work is pretty broad and um, the topics that we cover, um, but really we're looking for quality of life when it comes to environment and all the people that live in our state and in the, in the different environments that we have. Um, so those things include access to clean energy, accessible and protected public lands, coastal conservation, healthy rivers and waterways, removal and prevention of domestic and industrial pollution, and also sustainable agriculture. So that is the, the gist of Sierra Club, and, and I'm going to pass it on to Maggie now. Great. Thank you so much, Casey. Um, and we, yeah, Sierra Club has got a great presence in Alabama. We're lucky to have that um, power from their national as well as their, their state and local groups, and they've been a great partner for a long time. Um, Maggie, I'll let you talk about Wild Alabama, which is new but not new, and you can explain that. <laughs> hey, you guys, I'm Maggie Johnston, and I, too, want to say thank you so much to the League of Women Voters for bringing forth all of this good educational uh, information about um, the environment and environmental justice issues, um, and for encouraging people to get out and vote and to learn about um, who they're voting for before they cast their ballot. I think that's so crucial. Um, I want to say thank you to Valerie for her land acknowledgement because I was hoping that um, someone would do that. If, I, if, I, if you guys hadn't, I was going to jump in because I, I have a little bit of Choctaw in me, so I'm proud of it. Um, and then I also wanted to just um, give you a little bit of background Cindy did a great job of telling uh, who we are and where we're from, but um, my story, Casey, um, is that my dad used to get me out to look at the stars, and he didn't necessarily know all the names of the stars or the constellations, but he had a passion, and that passion was um, infused into my, my being, 
to not only love the stars, but to love nature. So through my years of education, passion for education and getting people involved with the natural world is, has been a big part of it. Um, I did teach at the Alabama School for the Deaf, so I should be signing while I'm talking, right? <laughs> um, I, it's really hard because ASL is not the same language as English, so you really can't do them both at the same time. Um, anyway, my years teaching science at the deaf school, I had the opportunity to get my students outside a lot. We would go to Chiha for hikes. We would uh, go to Count McDowell for environmental education. And that's where I fell in love with getting people outdoors. Um, the opportunity to introduce young people to the natural world is very powerful. But it's also important to introduce older people to the natural world. And so I'll talk some more about that when we're answering the questions later. Um, let's talk a little about Wild Alabama because after about 17 years at Camp McDowell, I unsuccessfully retired again. And now I'm executive director of Wild Alabama. And Wild Alabama is an organization that has been around a long time with a lot of different names. It started as the Bankhead Monitor um, in 1990s, it was about 30 years ago. And then it evolved into a Alabama wide organization and then it, a regional and became Wild South. And just this past year, the decision was made to break up Wild South and um, go back to a more state run organization. So we are Wild Alabama and we're proud of it. And we're doing some really fun and cool things. Um, my share screen isn't going to work very well for some reason, so Kathy is going to share my screen and show you, if you'll um, go over there from beginning, perfect, well, in a minute, <laughs> so you know what? For, I was actually on the Sierra Club State Executive Committee for years too. And the Wild Alabama mission is very similar to the Sierra Clubs, um, to inspire people to enjoy, value, and protect Alabama's wild places. So we are a partner with Sierra Club and we hope to continue that relationship in lots of different ways and other organizations as well. Um, that, photo is me with a group of teachers, uh, educators out in the Sipsy wilderness on a really cold and rainy day. And they were having the time of their life. We had a good time out there in the Sipsy. You can flip to the next one. So we say that we inspire people to enjoy, value, and protect. Well, you can't value and protect something that you don't really understand, that you don't fall in love with. So the enjoying is one of the huge parts and that includes um, education. We do a lot of outings. This is a group of um, adults that we had, um, I had on the Pinhoti Trail recently and we were doing um, a stretch of the Pinhoti. And this one was not so much a cleanup as just an exposure to the trail and um, a hike, flip. Kathy, if you will. And then we take it to another level. This is the Pinhoti Trail um, two days ago when I was out there with a group of volunteers. Um, and these guys came with their hard hats and their loppers and their, we do have um, Hayward, the, the guy on the right had his weed eater because we were not in the wilderness area. In the wilderness area, you can't take mechanized equipment. You have to have chainsaws and hand tools. But we were in the Talladega National Forest on a stretch that is allowed to have some mechanized equipment. So we were doing uh, trail maintenance on a couple of mile stretch there. The hey Maggie, would maybe if in case anyone doesn't know what the Pinhoti Trail is, maybe give a little. Oh, break. good idea. The Pinhoti Trail is a long distance trail that um, goes through Alabama. It actually starts at Flag Mountain, which is a state forest um, near Sylacauga. 
and it continues all the way up and through the Talladega National Forest, um, 138 miles through the Talladega National Forest, and then on and into Georgia and connects to the Benton Mackay and then the Appalachian Trail. So it's an over 400 mile trail that originates in Alabama. And if you haven't ex been exposed to it, um, call me because I can take you out there and I love that place. Um, it goes across Chiha and several other um, amazing uh, mountains. This particular one was um, at Claremont Gap, Gap near Talladega. So flip to the next one. Good call, Cindy. And this is another, um, this is over in the Bankhead National Forest, which um, the Sipsi Wilderness is what most people think of when they think of the Bankhead, but that's just one small part of the Bankhead National Forest. And there are some sandstone glades in the forest that are just amazing ecosystems and they're little microcosms within the greater ecosystem. And we have volunteers who go out and keep them cleared of vegetation that are not native to that area. So this um, is Melanie, who's out there doing some work um, uh, last weekend. You can go to the next one. Now I said in wilderness areas, and there are three in Alabama, the Sipsi Wilderness, there's Chiha Wilderness, and there's Duggar Mountain Wilderness. And in those wilderness areas, you're not allowed to have a chainsaw. If you're gonna do any trail clearing, you have to use a crosscut saw. And that's what this photo is showing here. Um, this young lady, Kat, is actually in training to be a volunteer wilderness ranger. That's an organization within our wild Alabama um, of people who um, learn lots of ambassador skills as well as the technical skills of doing the work in the wilderness. They meet and greet hikers along the trail and um, help people find their way out if lost, which happens in the Sipsi. <laughs> and then our organization is one of the few in Alabama, I think we may be the only one who offers crosscut saw training. And actually I went through it myself two weekends ago. It was quite a good um, workout, let me tell you. All right, next. Here is our Wild Alabama crew. Um, that's me kneeling on the left, and then Kim Waits, who is an absolutely amazing um, person who knows a lot about wilderness stewardship and character and how to maintain it. Mark Kalinske is kneeling. He is a um, part-time contract person who teaches things like crosscut saw training. And then Janice Barrett is standing next, and she is She's been with this organization since it was the Bankhead Monitor back in the 1990s. So she has the history as well as the passion for what we do. And then Joseph or Joe Jenkins is kneeling on the right. He is our contract wildlife biologist and um, has been doing volunteer work with us for years. He's, his master's degree was um, thesis was studying the flattened musk turtle and the Black Warrior water dog that are endangered and endemic to the Black Warrior up in the Bankhead area. So that's us and that's my contact. Thank you and I'll throw it back to Cindy. All right, thank you so much, Maggie. And um, we're, all, we're a little bit over our like internal timeline but I'll say just a little bit about the Alabama Rivers Alliance since I'm wearing two hats today and we, um, we, you know, we talked about valuing, they, the other speakers talked about valuing our nature and our earth and protecting it. And Alabama has a, a lot to value when it comes to our water. We have, uh, we're number one in freshwater um, biodiversity in the whole entire country. So we have many species of fish and crayfish and turtles and um, snails and mussels that are found only here in Alabama, only in very special places. And um, many of those have, uh, we also have many species that have gone extinct over the years because of the exploitation that um, Valerie so eloquently talked about 
So at the Rivers Alliance, we were formed in the mid nineties by grassroots um, organizations like Friends of the Locust Fork River, um, who may be part of the Cahaba River Society, which is a staff environmental organization, the first river focused organization in the state. Um, the Sierra Club, I believe, was initially in that coalition that, that eventually became the Alabama Rivers Alliance. And, and the idea was that we needed a statewide voice um, to look at state policy, to kind of travel in those state regulatory and legislative circles, um, you know, focusing on water. But we also couldn't do that and couldn't protect all of the 132,000 miles of rivers and streams that we have in Alabama without um, having the communities that these waterways exist in being involved and being the eyes and ears on the ground, on the water, um, finding those, those threats and, and working together to, to decide what the solutions are. So we've always been kind of a, an alliance, we've always been an alliance, we've been a coalition-based, partnership-based organization. And we have though, I think historically, I think we can admit we've historically focused on the ecological Im, uh, impacts and the ecological uh, needs of, of our waterways and not as much on the impacts to people and recognizing that the people who are impacted by the threats to our waterways are not the ones who are causing the problems. So we have, um, we are evolving in our movement here in Alabama, uh, in our environmental movement and our water movement to, to really focus on a lot of, to broaden our view and to broaden our partnerships so that we are addressing not only um, protecting those ecosystems, but protecting those communities and looking at the voices and making sure those voices that maybe weren't traditionally involved in our movement are a part of the conversation about what the solutions are. Um, I'll just highlight one of our particular programs that I'm, I'm particularly proud of and, and I think does this very well, which is our Southern Exposure Documentary Film Fellowship Program, that we each summer we bring in four film fellows from around the country, um, professional filmmakers who are early in their career to create documentary films about stories, places, environmental issues in Alabama. Um, we work with all of our partners to, and communities to, to figure out what the best um, topics are going to be for that year so we can use them in our advocacy work, um, targeting uh, decision makers for community uh, outreach, public education, organizing. And um, it's been a great value. It took this program over from the Southern Environmental Law Center back in 2018. And I think it's really been um, a value for all of our partners as well as for our advocacy work. So um, we have many other programs and work on many issues, but I will move on to our question and answer part of the uh, program today. And we really wanted to focus you know, people talked about the, their, their origin stories and um, mine was similar in that I grew up in a place and played outside, but my family um, really taught me to civic engagement and to be involved in my community at that civic level. And so that's one of the reasons I think that the League of Women is such an uh, interactive place for me to get involved because we want to talk about how voting, how um, our elected officials and uh, intersect with our environmental work. Environment is not this silo over here that we can protect without understanding the intersection of what decisions are being made and who's making them and how we impact those decisions and getting more people uh, educated and how to vote around those issues. But also we wanna talk about the intersection with environmental justice and justice and voting are also very um, tight and awareness around those issues right now as we go through this um, terrible repeat of history trying to suppress votes in our state and suppress voter registration in our country. And so I think that this is a really good time to talk about all of the intersections of these issues. So my first question to all of our speakers and all, all uh, we can go in the same order, Valerie and Lisa, is just talk about how your work intersects with environmental justice issues and how um, environmental issues are impacting um, the communities and the members that you serve. Um, okay, um, well, our work, our charge is education. And so some of the ways, as I was saying, um, when we started that AIC was created because 
there was a need for indigenous people to get to know one another. There was a need for indigenous people because there's not just Creek, Chickasaw, Choctaw, um, Cherokee here. There are people from other places that live here in Alabama. And at, the, at that particular point, before now, there wasn't a way for all of us to connect. So as our charge is education, we monitor things that are happening within the other tribes around the nation. And we've created um, a group of people that are interested in learning more about contemporary issues um, to share that information with so that we're all aware of what's happening. I think that the Dakota Access Pipeline um, saga is what I'll call that is was detrimental in showing us that national news did not care about us. It didn't care about our issues. And we, it, it was upon us um, to get this information out to each other. And so, you know, we have relationships all over the United States, I do, with different people who all share the commonality of um, environmental justice. Um, AIC, we've been instrumental in creating dialogue between some of the area colleges to some of the native nations in order to make sure that they have adequate representation when they're talking about, um, what do you say? Um, when they're talking about the, the environment, when they're talking about being good stewards, when they're talking about um, archeological findings. And so we're just kind of being a bridge, so to speak. But. Hey, Casey, would you like to answer that as well? Want me to repeat the question? Got stuck, sorry. Um, you asked about environmental justice issues and environmental issues. Yeah, how does, so how, how does your work intersect with environmental justice and, and how, another way to sort of look at that is how are environmental issues impacting the members that you serve? So historically with our chapter, Sierra Club Alabama chapter, um, our groups and our, our members, our volunteers have kind of been a support system for communities that are being affected by environmental issues, such as um, industrial pollution in areas like Mobile and North Birmingham and Uniontown, and, and then various places across the state, even when it comes to education, that's still um, a disparity that people can experience as they don't get an education on these environmental issues. Um, and in the past, we have been supporters of those communities, but we're prioritizing now that, that those leaders and those communities are actually becoming leaders in our organization. So it's not that we're just a, cu a cushion or you know, a supporter, a funder, a moral support system, but instead those communities are getting represented through the Sierra Club because that's essentially what we want to be is diverse and equitable and um, have a representation of members that come from all types of communities, all types of backgrounds. And that just makes us more effective. Diversity always brings effectiveness, whether it's biodiversity in nature or it's diversity of people um, that when it when it comes to, you know, being being civically engaged, that that diversity is also healthy and rich for us. Um, and then and then environmental issues in general, you know, all of our groups are in different physiographic regions. So there are different regions all over the state that have different environmental issues just because of the environment itself, whether it's um, timber harvest or coal ash pollution or um, industrial waste in different places, or if it's just barriers to recreation, all of those different spaces across our state are affected by different things. And those people represent those different environments. Great, wonderful points there. Um, Maggie? Yeah, I actually jotted some things down, so I'd try to stay in my two minutes. <laughs> um, Wild Alabama primarily focuses on public lands and most specifically federal lands like national forest. This is land that belongs to all of us. Uh, and in protecting our forest, we're protecting not just trees, but entire ecosystems, soil, water, and air. Healthy forests provide clean water and air for all of us, even if we never step into a forest. Conservation and the protection of ecosystem services is the very foundational layer of environmental justice. 
Eco equals home. Since Wild Alabama's mission is to inspire all people and educate all people, it's our goal to have informed citizens of all ages who respect and protect public lands. We've found a large part of our general population has no idea about what is meant by public lands and even less idea what a wilderness is. So one way we're hoping to influence future leaders is by leading what we call venture out hikes. And we're doing some this May for school, high school students and during the summer as well from our local community. And we'll have these hikes set up with a lot of diverse groups. Some are at risk youth, some are youth leaders. And then we also offer outings to a lot of diverse adult groups. We have a program that we call Forest Watch. And from the perspective of the work of Wild Alabama, keeping an eagle eye on the management of our forest on public lands and federal policies that drive that management is a powerful way to mitigate climate change. Our forests are our first defense against climate change. And climate change is the greatest environmental threat that we face. Climate change affects every single one of us. Drinking water of many of us originates in our national forests as well. Talladega National Forest houses the headwaters of the Coosa River. The Bankhead houses the headwaters of the Black Warrior River. Sedimentation and pollution of the water from bad forestry practices or illegal dumping affect the quality of your drinking water. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you, Maggie. And at the Rivers Alliance, um, environmental justice is definitely uh, intersects with a lot of our issues. Um, it has for, for all of our existence. Um, we work on a variety of, of efforts that try to get at improving and um, moving away from the extractive industries that we have. Our waterways actually supply, as I mentioned, our drinking water, um, about 70% of the population of Alabama gets their drinking water from surface water, which is what we call it, rivers and streams, bays and, and reservoirs. And um, those surface waters are where these industries, whether it's coal plants, um, paper mills, you know, uh, timber harvesting that clear cuts and runs off the, the soil from the, from the earth into the water, all these things uh, run into these surface waters and cause our drinking water to be threatened. And we know that, well, we, so we try to work with agencies like the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, which was a question in the chat, but what is uh, all of our relationships with that, which we can get to later. But the um, Department of Environmental Management is our environmental regulatory agency we're supposed to be in Alabama. And um, we do have to have relationships with with them, we have to have relationships with our state legislators as well, and at the local level groups need to have relationships with their local governments, because these are the folks that can make decisions and are making decisions that impact um, how much of this pollution gets into our water, whether or not the Clean Water Act is enforced, whether or not the Safe Drinking Water Act is adequate. Um, we we have to stop a lot of this pollution before it gets to the treatment facility. We, we, our water will not be affordable. Um, if, it, if it is now, it will not be affordable for the future if we're trying to just engineer our way and treat our way out of all this pollution. So um, working on those types of issues. We're also working um, since COVID, we really got engaged in trying to make sure that access to water is, is fair. And um, particularly with the funding sources that are coming down from the federal government, there's not been any funding for water bills and for water, uh, utilities to, to do shutoffs and some of our water, water utilities have and some of them have not but people are, are racking up pretty big water bills and as, as they are with energy as well some of our energy partners are working on that but there is a new state program being developed um, that is similar to the energy assistance program called LIDI and it's going to be called LIWAP for lack of a better way to say it um, a water a household water assistance program for low-income families that has been funded by the federal government. So we're looking into with national partners and other uh, communities, how do we make sure that program gets implemented in Alabama? Um, so those are just some of the, the things we're working on in respect to environmental justice, but it's definitely uh, a huge part. And of course, climate change. Um, climate change, climate change is sort of the overlay of everything <laughs> that we all work on. And it is impacting um, marginalized communities more than anyone else. So everything we can 
do as urgently as we can um, it needs to be addressing that. And our 83% of our water use in Alabama is for uh, our fossil fuel um, energy production. So we need to make sure that that's another intersection with water that's very important to us. All right, my second question to everyone is um, how, and I, I guess some of it, we really all kind of answered this a little bit, but at least I did because I can't talk about anything without talking about elected officials, but you guys um, can elaborate a little bit on how important are elected officials in making decisions that impact your work and the people and places that you serve. And that can be at any level of government. Are we going in order again? Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> well, I think that, um, so indigenous people weren't considered citizens until 1924. Um, we didn't get the right to vote until 1965. We had freedoms taken away from us, such as religion, speech and all that before all of that was even a thing. Um, because of the policies that were in place to deal with the Indian problem, like genocide, assimilation, removal, relocation, a lot of our voice, our voice was stif our voices were stifled. And it wasn't just in indigenous areas. It was our brown communities, our black communities um, as well. So I think that when I'm looking for what is going to happen with voting and politicians, of course those things are important. It's important to know that we pe put people in office that are very aware of our history and what happened um, and try to reach us a little, you know, a little, a little bit more. Um, did that, that answer your question? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Valerie. Um, so I, like Cindy was talking about ARA um, and that's one of our partner organizations and also Conservation Alabama and um, Energy Alabama, all of those groups who are experts and they're working towards getting that information um, from a legislator or about legislation that they are very good at communicating that to us and through, to the public in general. And we're able to um, take that information and educate upon it, educate and advocate upon that information. So, you know, when we're, we are somewhat like a, a social group, but we're but we're also activists as well. So we we might have or a group might have a program every single month or an outing every single month. That program might be um, associated with a leg piece of legislation that's coming up, or just just having um, a speaker that is re relaying information about an environmental issue and then having discussion discussion about it in the end, it usually comes down to that in a local area or talking about state level communication comes up just through conversation about things that we should do. Um, more formal things is that we might um, have like a letter writing party in um, response to legislation or you have a group that um, is just or a committee that's even just discussing um, the political activities of a certain candidate. Maybe. All right, I'll jump in. Um, how important are elected officials to what we do? Extremely important. <laughs> Um, they are the ones who establish national forests and wilderness areas, and they're the decision makers who decide on so many important funding decisions about these public lands that we're trying to take care of. Um, and we have to be careful and, and wise in who we vote for and who we put into that office. On federal lands, like our national forest, every new presidential administration, so potentially every four years, comes new proposed policy changes and management plans. Two of the worst presidents ever in regard to preservation of public lands were Bush Jr. and Trump. And while as a 501c3, we cannot support any specific candidate, we can communicate to our elected officials the value of the land and the resource protection. In fact, we have several dates already set up for uh, leading some elected officials on hikes. I'm calling them strolls in the Sipsi wilderness. Some of these are local 
people, local politicians who oversee the Sipsi wilderness, but they've never been there. So we're taking them and their families out and National Trails Day is June the 5th. Um, so we're gonna be leading, we've already got several people um, signed up and I hope they show up. Um, we do regularly comment on proposed policy changes. We write a lot of letters. Um, we sign on to letters that groups like Alabama Rivers Alliance and Southern Environmental Law Center, they're a strong partner of ours. Uh, thank goodness for them. Um, lots of others, the waterkeeper groups, we support the letters that they write as well and sign on to those. So that's a little bit of what we do. Great, thank you, Maggie. So um, the last question that we have formally um, here and, and then we can, there's a few questions in the chat we'll get to. The, Maggie mentioned that they're a 501c3 organization and I think most of us are in this um, circle. And so I wanted to clarify that um, that that just means that our donations are tax deductible um, from, and that if uh, we cannot get involved in electoral politics, which means we can't tell you which candidate we like or which candidate we should vote for or get anywhere near um, elections. But that's when we talk about voter education and the league, the league is, is the same way. Um, the league focuses on that nonpartisanship and really just educating voters. And the league has some great programs for finding, you know, helping you find out what, where candidates stand on certain issues. Um, Vote 411 is a great thing that they do, um, or that we do at the league to, to send questionnaires to candidates and find out where they stand on certain issues. So it is upon us as, as people and as voters to do that legwork to, to get the 411 or get to the organizations that are putting that information out. And particularly us as environmental organizations, we haven't, I don't, I, I don't think that we've been as engaged in, in the sort of 20 years I've been involved in this, in that voter education and voter registrations per se, everything we do is educating people in Alabama, so it's educating voters by default. But, um, if that, you know, focusing more, how, how is your organization um, thinking about, and Maggie kind of already mentioned this with, with getting decision makers out into the woods, you know, how are you thinking about educating voters? Are you starting to think of that, that specific type of education more than it used to? Do you have any programs planned for the future? Um, and, and how can we partner with the league to and other groups that are doing this work to really raise, um, to get more, you know, more people registered and, and more um, information to voters about who they're voting for? And we'll go in the same order. So I think that part of um, what we do with AIC, obviously we're a new organization. So we have not gotten into anything in terms of political other than uplifting um, some of our area candidates that were, like, that were Native American um, so in, and being in support of them. Um, we don't necessarily share partisan um, things, activities, we don't, we don't participate in any of that. I'm trying to be mindful that of my 501c3 status and I'm new at it, so. <laughs> but the other part of that is um, within our group, we do have people that are in higher level positions and I just try to make sure that the content that we share in those groups and with them is specific to them understanding a little bit more about um, the indigenous story, the indigenous problems, like um, things that are going on with other indigenous nations and how that can happen here, like uranium mining and um, the water, you know, the water, water going on the stock market, that type of thing. So we're not, you know, how can we partner with League of Women Voters? I think that partnership um, is one of our primary keys to increasing awareness. And I think that, you know, we would be more than happy to assist with something like that. Valerie, I'd like to ask before Casey, before you go, uh, um, sort of a clarifying question. Is voting and um, access to voting uh, a challenge in the indigenous communities as it is in, in other communities? Um, Unfortunately, um, a lot of the areas where we see heavy suppression 
are like North Dakota, South Dakota, um, in which the reservations are very rural. And so, you know, they've started to create different laws. Of course, there's organizations there that are putting in the work to make sure that, you know, like one of the laws passed was saying that, you know, even though it's rural, everybody has one post office and, you know, a post office. Well, they wanted everybody to have a street address. Well, I don't know how you can have street addresses in the country. So they had to go through a lot street addresses, re-register everybody and make sure, you know, to get that native vote out. This, you know, during the last election, um, I think the native vote was crucial to in a lot of states for the turnout that they supplied, you know, the current administration. Um, and while we are still in very red states for some of the reservations, you know, those, there are particular groups there that do assist. And we just try to uplift them um, as much as we can. Great, thank you. So a little breakdown of um, Sierra Club. We, we are a C4 organization, but we have a C3 aspect. So, so you, can, you can donate to the Sierra Club Foundation, which goes to national and then comes directly back to our chapter as a C3. And so you do get, it is tax deductible. Um, but, and those funds would only go to outreach and education. They're only for education. I mean, we support a lot of different um, educational groups of Earth Days and um, different programs that have been sustainable throughout the past. That comes from our C3 um, status. We, we can endorse candidates and we are C4, but we haven't been politically engaged like we could be. So that's something that we've been discussing. And we do have um, an engaged political committee right now. And so they, they would be the ones that are discussing how we should do that. And some things in the past um, were that we might do a candidate profile or something that would just be kind of social media based. And it, it's just, we still want to be um, nonpartisan because it's somewhat just more effective in our state um, and more, um, I guess, peaceful, I guess. I don't, I don't know how to say that, but um, it can be more effective. So if we just present the facts and let's say that you just have a 50, 50 um, amount of information of here's the environmental issue and here are the candidates. So then you make your own personal um, opinion from that. And then on the ground floor with that C3 status, we, we are educating. So we are going from elementary school kids to high schoolers, to young adults, to adults, um, to senior citizens. We develop, we have different programs and different opportunities that all of those individuals can, um, can participate in. And what, what we discuss is that they should be transitional. So, you know, young kids and high schoolers, they're learning about environmental issues in general. And then um, they, they might even have that, um, the, the legal issues part of it. So they might even understand letter writing. And so that when they get to be a voting citizen, they can actually take the right action and take it in an effective way. And that, I don't know if I was just speaking directly from Sierra Club, that might've just been through my educator brain, but, but that, that we have the same, same concepts and goals that we wanna meet. Great, thank you. Yeah, getting the younger folks, um, building that ethic early is very important. Maggie? Environmental education. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> That's what we are all about. Um, so, yeah, a very successful engage, citizen engagement program that we've been doing recently, sort of thanks to COVID because we had to do Zoom, but it was um, very successful, um, is doing what we call virtual learning and you can go on our website, which is www.wildal.org. And there's a calendar where we list things that are coming up, both outreach kind of thing and uh, virtual learning. And you can register on the virtual learning part of the website too. Uh, we've had um, Scott Duncan did a three-part series on the biodiversity in Alabama and climate change. Bill Deutsch did uh, talk about rivers of Alabama and watersheds of Alabama and helping 
the general population learn a little bit more. Um, we have had up to 130 folks register for some of those and uh, lots of people who didn't get registered reaching out to me, asking me to send in the recording, the recorded end of it. Um, we've been doing some work on, um, I call it JEDI, justice, I can't get them in the right order, but diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and that's through a National Science Foundation grant that we partner with a lot of environmental education organizations around the state. Um, we work with a lady from Birmingham, T. Marie King, who is an um, amazing and dynamic uh, trainer on diversity, equity, and inclusion. If you don't know about her, check, up, check her out. She's wonderful. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of that for educators. Um, we have been doing some virtual learning that's more directed specifically at our forest and the people who visit them, like map reading skills and leave no trace. But once again, getting the information out into the general population. Um, lots of posting social media. Wild Alabama is, um, we've got Kim Waits back there constantly posting on social media. And when Wild Alabama staff give any kind of presentation to a civic group or school, um, we always end with a what can you do? And vote is one of the biggest parts. Vote and vote wisely. Find out who you're voting for. Um, and then encouraging people to let their elected officials know how important it is to them to have environmental policies that are strong and important. And then if they do vote pro-environment, thank them. Say thank you. Um, and I would personally love and welcome any suggestions for other ways that we could help get the word out because um, I've for years been an educator who had a captive audience, whether it be a classroom of students or a, a workshop full of educators who were there wanting to learn um, or 200 students from a school who are at my environmental center. But guess what? Getting the word out to individual citizens is a whole different thing. And uh, so if you've got good ideas, share them. Yeah, great points, very much. Very, it is, some, I'm always surprised um, just from my bubble when people haven't heard of our organization or maybe other environmental organizations um, in the state. And I'm like, we're, we're doing everything we can. We just don't, you know, we, we can, we, well, one, we don't usually have marketing budgets, but, <laughs> but we also, um, we do a lot on social media. And that's what we do have to rely a good bit on people um, you know, finding, finding out how to connect as much as we're all trying to, to get our word out. Um, and I'll just, you know, Maggie brought up another point about um, about talking to elected officials about the issues you care about. You know, so that's really where we put our emphasis at the Alabama Rivers Alliance is we, in our experience with um, trying to advocate to legislators once they're elected about our issues, um, we, they don't seem educated about them. They don't seem like they're hearing from their constituents enough about them. So our issues, there's a lot of noise um, and very important noise, let me say, coming at legislators. Everybody's got, um, you know, important issues that are facing their communities and, and um, they're, you know, unfortunately, because there are, most of our state legislators don't have staff, it's really who can get to them, um, be the most compelling, and be the loudest, and that they feel um, what issues have the most support from their constituents, since we don't have money to give them either, um, and we can't do that as tribal and series. Um, it really is upon us to make sure that we're talking uh, on a regular basis to elected officials um, while they run, so that once they run, they they've heard about these issues and then they know they need to pay attention. Um, we do work with Conservation Alabama as well. Um, Casey mentioned that Sierra, uh, Sierra Club uh, also helps us lobby with with grants that they are able to give us. And um, Conservation Alabama is another environmental organization with the 501c4, so they can get more involved in elections and. Um, endorse candidates and things like that. So we, we work with them as well on that front. And those are all of our planned questions. Um, we do have some questions in the chat. So um, we're, we're, we said that we would go till 2.30 kind of in our minds. So if y'all um, 
can stick with us. We'll, we'll answer some of these questions. One of the questions from, from a while back is, how are environmental groups in Alabama interacting locally with county and municipal governments? And I have some thoughts on that, but I thought I would throw it to um, Casey. Since you guys have local chapters or groups, would you want to take a stab at that one? Yeah, I mean, so like I said before, we kind of personalize the way that we interact because each group really has its own personality. Um, and so like our Mobile Bay group, they're very active in communicating with their officials. Um, what, what did you specifically ask about communicating? How are, with? How are environmental groups um, interacting with their local county and municipal governments? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so it kind of just depends on the group. There, there are some groups that are more active in getting it out in hikes on um, the weekends or during the week, and then there are some that are very politically active. So Mobile Bay is a good example of one that's very politically active because they have members there that want to be civically engaged the most. And um, I would say that, but then also it sometimes it comes through our executive committee or the, which we we traditionally sent it through the conservation committee that we might um, respond in a way. I mean, that might be ADEM, I don't know about county, but but it could be specific in that way too. So a group might, um, might communicate or it might come from, you know, the chapter if we're gonna write something or communicate something, but then sometimes it's just from the group. Okay. I don't know Does if I answered your question, to... but maybe. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone else want to? Yeah, I'm going to jump in. Um, of course, I, I'm new at this. I mean, officially, I started in October, but the organization officially became Wild Alabama, separating from Wild South only in January. So there's lots of irons in my fire right now, if you know what I'm talking about. But um, one of the things that I have been able to do is to reach out to our office is in Moulton, and um, I'm developing a, a good relationship, friendship with the mayor of Moulton who wants to see it become the gateway to the bank head and, you know, trying to reach out. And we've written a lot of letters and invitations to other local officials as well. So just a little bit in it. <laughs> Can I make one more comment, Cindy? Yes, yes, absolutely. So one, one thing that comes from National is a program that we have. It's called Ready for 100. Um, and we're trying to activate that a little bit more here. And that would be that, and the, the main goal is that um, our groups would communicate with the mayor and the mayor's office to get them to sign on that they would be ready for clean, clean like 100% ready for clean energy. And they, so their, their um, infrastructure, whatever that they're working on, um, and city planning would move towards 100% clean energy. And it's just a sign on thing. So that's, that's one of the, an example of a program that, um, that we are trying to engage and that's kind of county city based. Great. And I guess Valerie, to make that question more inclusive, I should have said, and also tribal governments because tribal governments have different, um, different set of, of rules. And so if you wanna, if you wanna go there or, or give us some enlightenment on that. Well, um, now here in Montgomery, what's kind of interesting is that they've actually established a cultural affairs office. And so a lot of us um, are meeting specifically with that with the department in order to, I guess, let them know what our intents are in terms of activities and programs um, and best ways that the city can assist, assist us. Um, for getting the information out or support or finances or what have you. So that part of it, I am excited about. I think that that's something that's gonna be very critical for all of us, um, you know, nonprofits, artists, musicians, as we explore, you know, concepts of what makes Montgomery, Montgomery, what makes Alabama, Alabama. Um, so that's exciting. Great. And I'll just um, say that the, for on the, from the water perspective, as I mentioned, we have a lot of local partners. And if your watershed goes through a municipal um, or county, whichever one of them does, 
we do have groups that are very engaged with their local governments. Issues like stormwater um, are actually governed at the, the medium and small size cities. I mean, medium and large cities or county metropolitan areas have their own um, enforcement of and, and responsibilities and permits for um, regulations around stormwater runoff into our rivers and streams. So local groups are engaging with local governments to create ordinances or to fight if that's necessary um, for better stormwater protections. Um, dirt going into our waterways is not a healthy thing, even though it seems like dirt's in there anyway, but it's not, it's not a good thing when it's just too much. Um, and then a great example too of a local government interaction that led to a good state policy um, fight was when the state government tried, the state legislature tried to pass a ban on plastic, on local communities' ability to regulate plastic. Um, and so, you know, there's movement in other states to put um, fees on plastic bags in, in stores or um, single-use plastics, um, kind of trying to move away from that because we do have so much problem with trash and plastics in our waterways and in our communities. And so the, lo the legislature, this was a kind of a conservative um, uh, set bill from a group Nancy Loves called ALEC that was going around a bunch of different states and the uh, legislature took it up. And then we realized that local governments didn't want the state government in Alabama telling them what they can and can't do. I mean, it's going to fight with monuments, it's going to fight with minimum wage. So we can't, we engaged partners, we, I would say Conservation of Alabama and the little bit keeper of groups were involved in meeting on this, but engaged partners to engage their local governments to talk to those legislators and say, we, you know, we may not have any plans right now to pass a ban on plastic, but we sure don't want you telling us we can and can't regulate it. We need to. So it actually ended up being surprising to some of those legislators that this was a bill that was controversial. Um, sometimes I think they just get it from a, a source that they have a relationship with and trust and they just throw it out there and don't really think about it. <laughs> but it, it worked. We fought it. And many states, uh, neighboring states, did not, were not successful in Alabama. Was successful. Um, so that's a way that it really is important to local governments. They can impact the state government as well. Um, let's see. Nancy threw out a whole bunch of issues. Nancy, I'm afraid I don't think we have time. We addressed some of those in our talk, but I don't think we have time to discuss all of those um, environmental issues that you ask about. Let me scroll on down because I've got a lot more in the chat. Um, uh, there's a question about, I'm not sure I missed anything. Are there any environmental bills in the state legislature in 2021? You guys want me to take that one or do y'all have? Raise your hand if you want to address that. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there aren't any that we introduce proactively. Um, we monitor bills, Conservation Alabama monitors bills, Southern Environmental Law Center, um, some of the other groups monitor bills. So the only, the biggest one I think that affects our work right now is the Open Records Act. Um, does anybody have that number off the top of their head? I should know this. Um, but Open Records Act legislation to improve open records. Kathy, do you have that number? Uh, yeah, Senate Bill 165. Senate Bill 165. Arthur, Arthur Orr's bill. Okay. And it, Senate Bill 165. And open records may not seem that like an environmental issue, but we use open records requests to find out information um, about pollution, what might be um, conversations going on between industries and um, you know, government regulators or government officials that we need to know about to, to get a better handle sometimes on, or it may be a permit that we know this is being violated at the environmental management. Um, so there's a lot of ways that we need information and it's not always easily accessible in the state. So that's a very important bill. We do support the improvements that are being made on that front. Um, I can't think of a direct environmental bill. Somebody. Anybody correct me if I'm wrong. We, we hoped to introduce a couple this year and if they just weren't quite ready, we didn't quite have the support we needed on, on, on those. So we'll, we'll stay tuned next year for um, some of the ones that we were talking about. And Conservation Alabama partners with a lot of us to, um, to put together a, a conservation policy agenda um, or policy guide for legislators. It's kind of what some of us at the statewide level 
kind of see as opportunities and the key issues that we might want legislation on. So um, they give that to legislators each year. And their website, it's, I've said them a lot, so conservationalabama.org. Um, can you name issues of, of importance to the city of Huntsville? Um, some folks are, somebody's meeting with the city council before I'm um, Anybody have specific information about the Huntsville area? We are trying to get more engaged up there. Um, we don't have, there is a river keeper on the Tennessee. And of course um, he has been, he's, he covers the entire basin and, and works um, all the way up into Tennessee itself. So the state of Tennessee, so he's got a lot on his plate. Um, I know that uh, working on um, what's called PFOAs and PFASs, which are river chemicals is um, something that he's worked on. Um, that's more, I think, on the, the north, northwestern part of the state than right there in Huntsville. But that was industry that was polluting 3M industry that had been dumping these chemicals legally um, for a long time. And then, um, they're just these chemicals that don't break down, so they're there. And now we know more about the harm that they cause and so there's some litigation going on around that. Uh, I know there's a lot of development in the Huntsville area and, and sprawl and, and eating up of farms and um, other places that are greener than, than just paved roads and buildings. So there's um, some stormwater issues and uh, we work where we're partners with the Land Trust of North Alabama to, um, they're trying to protect some of the lands in the area. So it's always good to give them a shout out. Hey, Cindy, um, I was just going to mention when you you had talked in the, at another meeting about this, the state water plan, I think that has a tremendous impact, potential impact on um, Huntsville. Yeah, so there's a uh, definitely a, a large effort that Alabama Rivers Land and partners uh, like Sierra Club and, and others that have been working on for a while to try to develop a state water plan that would address water use issues. Um, we, we have no Pretty much no regulation of how much water you use and that uh, an industry uses or um, how much water can be taken out of our rivers and streams for different uses. So, uh, and as I said, the largest um, withdrawal of water in the state is our uh, energy utility company for cooling coal and nuclear plants and other fossil fuel extraction. And so it's it's something that we need to think about with regards to interstate competition of waterways, as well as droughts, increasing droughts, um, floods. Um, it's not just a, a too little water issue, but sometimes we have too much water. And all of these are part of what the conversation should be around how we regulate water use, because we don't do that right now. How we manage our, um, and protect the water that's in our stream so that we keep that biodiversity, we keep that clean drinking water. Um, clean and um, so a water plan was is a large undertaking that takes some legislation. It also takes a lot of stakeholder input to negotiate what the different components are. But we definitely need some regulation of water withdrawals, and we definitely need protection of industry floods. And those are the two like the key pieces. And then the other parts like conservation efficiency and, and uh, some of those issues kind of flow from that. Um, well, <laughs> Cindy, um, Nancy mentioned in the in the chat that that both of our groups, several of our groups, are showing up for public meetings, um, such as Public Service Commission and also TVA. And TVA, you know, that would be in the Huntsville area too. And I think you mentioned several of the issues that affect um, the TVA in general and the citizens there. Yeah, I mean, that TVA operates nuclear plants um, and they have dams that have impacted our waterways, um, changed them mm -hmm. um, drastically forever. So that is TVA in the Huntsville area. And that also brings up a great point. Um, thank you for catching that, Casey, that the one thing you can talk about your city council, um, and I haven't heard anything going on like this in Huntsville, in Birmingham, uh, a group called GASP has just launched an effort to get a Green New Deal a climate plan, a people's climate plan for the city of Birmingham to work with the local government to get that. Um, I know in Mobile, our Mobile Baykeeper, Casey Callaway, who's been the director of Mobile Baykeeper for, and founder forever, um, 23 years, is uh, just left that position to be the first chief resiliency officer for the city of Mobile. 
So there's some exciting stuff going on at the municipal level. Climate change um, could bubble up from these cities. So that would be a great thing to talk to your um, to city council. I'd like to encourage people to get to know their local elected officials, you know, whether that's just making a phone call or going to have lunch, if you feel safe doing that these days, um, but making an effort to try to, to know some of your elected officials. Um, I put in the chat, my mom was a little local um, circuit clerk, but it, taught me the value of that each one of those people, even if they're the governor, they're just a person too. Mom used to say, they put their pants on in the morning just like you do. Well, go out and talk to them, get to know them, find out you know, what their interests are and, and then help them to see your interests and why it's important. Absolutely. Um, and, and somebody else in the chat mentioned uh, coal ash. That's another one for all over the state. Um, it's not necessarily something local governments uh, are addressing, but the Department of Environmental Management is currently writing permits for um, Alabama Power and a couple of the coal plants to just cap it in place and leave it there to pollute groundwater, which we know it's already doing in surface water. Um, TVA also has coal ash in their uh, watershed. In, in the area so it's definitely something to pay attention to um, we've got to get the, the federal regulations are were better than the no regulation that was there before but they still rely, uh, allow this cap in place and a lot of states are doing most states are in the southeast are doing more than Alabama when it comes to figuring out how to store this long term without polluting our waterways um, and without um, impacting communities uh, surrounding these places so We've got to continue, and there's there's a great website called alabamacolash.org where a great collaboration of organizations, um, including Sierra Club and River Science and all Riverkeepers and CLC are working on that issue. So there's a whole bunch of issues we can talk about. Um, 2.32, so I think we're gonna um, have to call it today. We, I believe, Kathy, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe we're gonna send out a follow-up email uh, with the recording potentially with the recording or a link and, and we can put our contact information of all the speakers and organizations that we work for in the in that follow-up so that folks can get in touch with us with any questions we did not get answered today. I was going to point out that if you want to save the chat, you just click on those little three dots at the bottom of your chat and it'll let you save your chat and then you'll have all that information on your desktop. Yes, and I've got the um, the meeting has been saved to YouTube. And so we'll have that available and we can send a link out. And um, I like the idea, Maggie, to get the questions. So everybody's got them going directly today, but we'll follow up. And um, if you've got, if people have ideas on topics that we need to talk about, that um, I guess I'd like to get suggestions from folks on the, on the call uh, when we send that out, if they'll let us know. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Valerie, Casey, and Maggie. You guys have been wonderful. This has been an amazing way to spend Earth Day week. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Y'all. Stay safe.